Now, now there were some, there was supposed to be some question time, but since we took it in the middle, maybe we'll uh, move right on to the next talk, and then there'll be an opportunity. Yeah, well, I'm gonna just just a moment. Uh, then there'll be opportunity to do it. So, I, because um, Liz is quite far away, Jimmy, maybe I'm just ask you to um, trade to, places, to, yeah. to trade places. opportunity to speak with you. I uh, come from the National Institute on Aging, where we support research on social, behavioral, economic factors that impact how we age. Uh, and our goal really is to maximize the active, healthy years of people's lives. And we appreciate that aging is a full life course phenomenon, and that many of the factors that determine how we age have roots in our early experience and unfold across the lifespan. What I'd like to do in these 10 minutes is try to shift gears a bit from the past two talks that we just had and think about some of the strategies that we might need to uh, use to tackle some of the biggest health problems that I see from where I sit at the Aging Institute may involve moving out of the clinic and into the everyday lives of individuals. And that'll require a kind of a mindset shift, I think, on two levels. Um, first, from thinking about health as something that we just treat in the clinic to viewing health and well-being as a whole life phenomenon that we shape through interventions in people's everyday lives. And second, from thinking about aging as something to fear and avoid, to seeing aging as a lifelong process, and older age as a time that's full of potential to, with enhanced well-being, new social roles, and active, productive engagement in society. And I think we are all aware that the population demographics are changing in the world. We're going to have a world filled with older people and far fewer younger people. And this poses really an opportunity to take advantage of this growing older population for the benefit of society. But what I'd like to argue is that there are two, well, and I'd also say that there are some, some very positive aspects about aging that are maybe underappreciated. So for example, oh, well, that's Sorry. What that is. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> it's probably very distracting. Um, so there's. <laughs> we'll give it back to her at the end thank, of the session. Thank you. He's only saying that maybe you for the yeah. time being weird. Really <laughs> <laughs> So, so just to emphasize that there is this great potential, there's quite a lot of psychological research that shows that successful aging is associated with improvements in life satisfaction and emotional well-being, increases in world knowledge and experience, a tendency to come to prioritize social and emotional goals much more strongly, and an aptitude in managing our social relationships. But I think that there are really two major challenges that can undermine our potential to take advantage of, of this growing older population. The first is around failures of self-regulation, especially around health behaviors that can impact people's lives. And the second is around stressful, isolating, or impoverished social environments. And I just want to touch on these two and then talk about some. <laughs> So uh, these data show that, this is from the United States, that poor health behaviors are thought to be responsible for 40% of the preventable deaths in our society, maybe 75% of the health care costs. These poor health behaviors like smoking, drinking, poor diet, lack of exercise, contribute to chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes. And they're thought to lie sort of at the root of failures of self-control that people may be exerting. And these, these kinds of failures of self-control can undermine our, this sort of advances in life expectancy that we're finding and really ruin the quality of life that we experience in our later years. Um, failures of self-control often are apparent very early in our lives. You see it in school children who fail to achieve educational outcomes and then fail to get good occupational roles. You see it in addictive behaviors that later in life unfold into full-blown addiction chronic illnesses, obesity, and all kinds of suffering and distress that may be accompanied with that. These data from the Dunedin Longitudinal Study followed children from birth through age 32 and show that poor self-control assessed early in childhood was associated with both higher levels of health problems 
and lower levels of economic success and greater financial struggles. So across a wide range of domains, it's becoming increasingly clear that failures of self-control in personal, social, financial, and occupational spheres are undermining adaptive development and healthy aging for individuals. A second challenge is associated with environments that put people at risk for social isolation or high social stress. The data here that are on the left come from a number of longitudinal studies that though very different populations all send one particular message, and that is that the lower the level of social integration or connectedness that people feel, which is measured on the bottom, the higher the level of mortality there is among those individuals. So that low social connectedness is associated with higher mortality across all of these very different cohorts. The, the, the risk for mortality of, of um, low social integration in this analysis was as high as the risk of smoking, actually. And at the time that these data were published, we didn't really have a full appreciation of what you were talking about earlier. That is, what are the mechanisms responsible for how social connectedness impacts our health? But over the, the ensuing years, there's been a number of advances. And one particular risk factor for poor health outcomes in older age that has emerged is loneliness. So loneliness predicts increases in blood pressure over time. It's also been associated with poor sleep quality, with depression, and with mortality. So it's important to underscore that, that most people don't report high levels of loneliness, also older people. But there are trends in our society for increasing numbers of older people to be living alone. And this puts them at risk for social isolation, particularly if they experience limitations in mobility or if their communities don't afford ample opportunities for social engagement. So I would argue that, that combating environments that put people at risk for social isolation is just as important as combating failures of self-regulation in improving ha healthy uh, development and, and aging. But this is going to require this mind shift of taking our perspective about how we deal with health outside of the clinic and moving it into the everyday lives of individuals. And many people now are engaged in novel interventions really aimed to do just that. So most interventions tend to focus on individuals. Uh, and many people are working to try to enhance behavioral self-regulation through a variety of forms, both in school. Mm -hmm. So we'll hear this afternoon. Oh, excuse me. Oh, okay. I'll get there. <laughs> yeah. So we'll hear this afternoon about some interventions to enhance self-control using contemplative practices. But I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about some of these approaches at these other levels in organizations and in communities that are trying to improve people's health. Showing some examples from some of the research that we support at the National Institute on Aging. This first uh, example comes from an area that's a big challenge for working adults, and that is dealing with the competing uh, challenges of managing work on the one hand and family responsibilities on the other. Um, this work family health intervention goes into workplaces and aims to reduce that conflict between work and family by changing the dynamics in the workplace, by promoting supportive behaviors on the part of supervisors, by putting in place workplace practices that promote a little flexibility between work and family time. They also aim to create a more of a, what we call a results-oriented work environment as opposed to a be here from nine to five oriented work environment. So the idea is that, that reducing this work-family conflict will reduce employee stress and improve their health, and then also have other positive consequences for their family members and even for the workplaces. So it may uh, enable the workplaces to retain their employees longer and even improve customer care, for example. So this is still 
ongoing in two industries, but the preliminary pilot data are very promising. What this shows is that managers, and these were nursing home managers, who were rated as very low on work family balance support, uh, had employees who had objectively larger numbers of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, like smoking, obesity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. The same study also showed that those with the worst managers slept on average 30 minutes less every night. So profound effects on the employee health just from the work environment in which they're living. I want to shift to a second example, and this is uh, about the Experience Core intervention, which puts older adult volunteers in inner city schools to do meaningful activities like tutoring, working in the library, helping with behavior management in the classroom. Um, volunteers are given sh small stipends, which enables the program to recruit poor and uh, overwhelmingly minority people who are often aren't reached by our health promotion kind of activities. Um, So researchers at uh, John Hopkins University are evaluating the health and cognitive impacts on the older volunteers of this program. And again, this is still in the field for evaluation, but the preliminary findings are also encouraging in terms of cognitive and physical activity benefits and mental health. For example, volunteers in the program are found to watch television two hours less per day than they used to. Um, physical activity is improved simply by having to get to the classroom and get up and down from those little chairs that the kids sit in. Uh, and some previous studies have shown that there are some long-standing uh, good effects for the schools. So some standardized test scores have improved and some schools have reported that the and the children don't uh, get sent to the principal's office for misbehavior quite as often. So uh, what's also interesting is that um, I think this has a great success in motivating older people to participate because it appeals to their motives to do something socially meaningful uh, instead of telling them to get out of the house or get more exercise more often. And I think these, these are just some testimonials from some of the participants and people can read them for themselves. But, but I think what they really point out to, and there are hundreds of these on, on the internet, is that this is a win-win program. It gives the older participants a sense of meaning and purpose in life. It helps the kids to achieve and it enriches the schools and thereby the community by offering this other role and this other person in, in the classroom environment. And I think these kinds of what we call spillover effects, consequences beyond the individual who's being targeted by the intervention, can be very difficult to model in cost-benefit analysis of how good a health policy intervention is. But we hope that these kinds of studies that are trying to document these effects will contribute to those discussions in a way. I want to give two more, make two more quick data points to sort of emphasize that we really can't afford not to take this potential of older people seriously. These data from the Rush Memory and Aging study bring home the point that when people lack a purpose in their life, it can have profound health effects. So here on the left, you see that among those individuals, and these were older adults age 70 or older, who started out with lower purpose in life, the rate of their cognitive decline was much faster than for those with higher purpose in life. And similarly, on the right side, those with lower, those with lower purpose in life had higher levels of disability over time. And there are many other health outcomes, including conversion to Alzheimer's disease that show the same relationships. The second point is that also the attitudes we hold about aging ourselves can have profound influences on our health. These are data from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging that show that individuals who held negative stereotypes about aging when they were young, sort of thought of aging as a time of infirmity, uh, disengagement, lack of potential, were more likely to have cardiovascular events 30 years later. So these kinds of negative attitudes of aging, whether we hold them ourselves or, or are held in society, are very pervasive and, and can be damaging. Uh, and the question is whether if society as a whole and we as individuals held more positive attitudes towards aging that we could see sort of different sorts of effects. 
So I've tried to argue that we need a, a mindset shift, that if we really want to support lifelong health and well-being, we need to think about intervening in people's everyday lives, creating the context that can reduce their stress, enable them to have self-control over their healthy behaviors, and also hopefully strengthen communities and relationships and that we also embrace uh, a positive attitude toward aging, both our own aging and society's aging, so that we can actually realize this potential. Thank you.